What is going on, beautiful people? My name is Bit Slam with Sam, and we are about to do the UFC Fight Night Vegas 93. Alex Perez taking on Tatsuro Tyra. Full card breakdown, starting off from the top of the bill. Let's waste no time, crack right into it. We got Alex Perez taking on Tatsuro Tyra. Guys, Alex Perez ate up my parlays last time when he finished and knocked out Mateusz Nikolaou. And let me tell you, you know, Alex Perez, he kind of had a career resurgence because a period of inactivity, you know, wasn't putting up fights. He was being known more for pulling out of fights than he was for turning up and doing anything in them. Takes on, you know, absolute young killer prospect, makes it to the end, you know, makes it to the end of that decision there against Muhammad Makayev. And in a fight where some people thought he won, <coughs> <coughs> choking on fucking nothing there, I thought Makayev did enough. And, uh, you know, he then moves forward, takes on Mitaush Nikolaou, knocks him unconscious, and it looks like Alex Perez is right back in the mix. You know, that's the thing about these divisions is sometimes when you don't have a stable division, all it takes is one, two good performances, and you are right back there in the mix. Now, speaking of somebody that can put on some good performances, Tatsuro Taira, the hottest thing out of Japan, is here, and, you know, he is a submission threat that does not stop attacking submissions. He's okay on the feet. I wouldn't say that he's at the level of an Alex Perez yet, but, you know, he has some power. You know, it was shown in his last fight where he got that knockdown. And while he hasn't looked absolutely perfect and flawless in his fights, he's always found a way to win, and more often than not, he's able to find a way to get that submission. Now, Alex Perez has submission kryptonite. You know, he got finished multiple times by submission under the UFC banner, and I truthfully just see this happening here. I think that he is being overinflated at the moment. You know, he's been overinflated because he was able to knock out Mateusz Nikolaou. And I had people DMing me saying, Mateusz Nikolaou is chinny. You know, he's going to get knocked out by Perez. And sure enough, that's what happened. And he took down my money with it. I'm not going to get that money back this weekend. I am picking and betting on Tatsuro Tyra. I don't think this fight goes the distance. I think Tatsuro Tyra finds a way to get the submission either in rounds one, two, or three. That is my official prediction. Moving on down the card. In the co-main event, which is a bit of an odd co-main event, it's a good thing it's a fight night, we have Ikram Alaskarov taking on Antonio Tricoli. And I know that Antonio Tricoli is a step-in opponent, but seems like nobody wants to fight Ikram Alaskarov. You know, nobody, people will sign on the dotted line, but nobody seems to turn up and actually fight Ikram Alaskarov. So Ikram Alaskarov, 15-1, that one loss, uh, an uppercut to Hamza Chemaev. It's always shown in Hamzat's uh, reel there. He can do everything, though. Ikram stuffed the takedowns of Hamza, you know, which led to it being a striking exchange. And on the attack, Ikram is just as good. You know, he's a great frame for this division, six foot tall, and he fills out that 185 pounds very, very nicely. On the flip side, Antonio Tricoli here. Uh, I watched a little bit about him, but honestly, he just doesn't seem the UFC level. And you could argue that Ikram hasn't beaten the best of the best. But he's a 10 to 1 favorite here, and it makes all the sense in the world. I think he might even be pushing like a minus 11, 1200 favorite. The pick undoubtedly has to be Ekram here, but it's sad because it's unplayable. Uh, these odds are absolutely unplayable. I want to bet money on Ekram. I really do, but I just can't lay that sort of money. Like, if you are betting on somebody's. And I actually. Pause in the action here. I looked at his inside the distance prop here, a little spoiler. It is not good. It's like a dollar twenty-four or something. You can't be betting on somebody like that. Even inside uh, round one for him to win is like a dollar seventy-four. So, Ikram Alaskarov, unplayable here, but I absolutely think he gets it done, and I think he finishes this fight inside the distance. But betting on a UFC fight with four ounce gloves, especially this guy's six foot five, fights out of Brazil. I just cannot lay that kind of money. But Hopefully in Ekram's uh, next fight, he gets a more tough matchup and I can pick him at better odds. Then we've got Timmy. Timmy Kwamba uh, taking on Lucas Almeida. Timmy Kwamba spoiled the party for me and a lot of betters out there because I thought that Bellagioki was going to be able to come in and get a finish. And Timmy Kwamba took him to a decision. Uh, it was a competitive back and forth fight where I believe that Bellagioki won two out of the three rounds. And uh, that was upper weight class. I think this is a little bit of a coming out party for him. It's like, hey, look, I stepped in. I did the thing. I fought a weight class up. Give me somebody in my weight class here. Give me somebody beatable. And that somebody is Lucas Almeida. While Lucas Almeida is a busy, you know, come forward striker, 5'11", pretty big for the featherweight division. I think Timmy Kwamba here is going to get some takedowns. He's going to smother him. 
and he's going to win a very convincing 30-27 decision. Timmy Kwamba is just a little bit better. A little bit better everywhere. If it was a pure striking matchup, you might favor Lucas Almeida, but even then, Lucas Almeida has shown to be a little bit chinny at points. So give me Timmy Kwamba. I'm eager to see what this young man can do now that he's at his natural weight class. And as for Lucas Almeida, I feel like he's had his shot to spine. Shot to spine? His shot to shine in the UFC. Uh, and now Timmy Kwamba is going to come in and steal any hype that was still existing around Lucas Almeida. Now, I fight that I've got a little bit more to speak about here. We've got Douglas Silva de Andrade taking on Miles John. Miles John is an interesting fighter because he's incredibly muscular. He comes in there like he's all heart, all gas, and no technique. He makes wrestling look so hard, but it looks like he trains really hard and just like blows all of his energy into it, you know. He is very sloppy. His technique is not good. And I think that in his fights where he's beating older guys and people without like a good skill, he's going to win it most of the time. And that's why I bet on him last time to beat Cody Gibson. Uh, in this matchup here, though, Douglas Silva de Andrade, he is old. And that's all that I have to say negatively against him. Beautiful record. 29-5 in mixed martial arts is a phenomenal record. You know, fighting out of Brazil, five foot seven. He's a good bantamweight. As you can see, he takes phenomenal care of his body. And some of those Brazilians, man, they keep fighting. Like, it's like they don't age the same as us because Miles Johns at 37 is not going to be any good. But Douglas Silva de Andrade in this matchup here, I think he's still got this, man. I think that Douglas Silva de Andrade as the underdog here, I think he can take out Miles Johns and uh, either win a competitive decision or even find a finish in the striking because... While Miles Johns is going to be the better wrestler, he he's known to gas. So I could see a late round two or round three finish from Douglas Silva de Andrade. The only problem is that uh, later in his career, Douglas Silva de Andrade, his output has slowed down a bit. And I don't know if he's going to throw enough. So if he just is inactive and still manages to stop the takedowns, I could see him losing a decision that way. But if I was to part with my money in this fight, I'm going with Douglas Silva de Andrade. Moving down the line, we have Asu Almabayev taking on Jose Johnson. Guys, isn't it fucking crazy? Jose Johnson has been fighting up at Bantamweight. Six feet tall. Big, tall motherfucker. I'm 5'11". I'm like 250 pounds, you know? And now Jose Johnson's going to be half of me and a little bit taller. So kind of crazy to think about. Uh, yeah, I don't know if he's going to make the weight. But if he does, I still don't know if it's going to serve him that well. It's going to look a bit wacky in there because Asu El Mubayev is not the tallest flyweight. But I don't think he's in any way undersized. Some guys at flyweight I think could cut down to a lower weight class if one existed. But um, not here. Asu El Mubayev is a fantastic wrestler who is more position over submission. He chain wrestles and he's got fantastic control time. Jose Johnson did struggle with the takedowns up at Bantamweight. And I don't know if him dropping down is to try and get some form of physical advantage to try and reinvent himself here. But I think he's just had some tough fights, and that's why he was losing. I don't think that this is the answer, and I think that uh, it's it's not going to work out for him. I think, honestly, I'm concerned for him uh, trying to make this weight, if anything. A Super El Mubayev will get him, take him down and most likely submit him. Uh, he's sitting at about an 8-1 to one favorite here, and again, that's almost unflavor. Uh, actually, yeah, no, maybe about a six to one, six to one favorite, Asu El Mubayev. and uh, you know it's it's kind of unplayable. That's the way I see it. Uh, I bet him initially, but the odds have since driven down. Uh, the line movement on this one has has shifted in favor of Asu El Mubayev, as it should. And um, yeah, Jose Johnson, I just don't know what the fuck he thinks he's doing. If this was a pure striking matchup, which it's not, then Jose Johnson would win, and would probably find a finish. But it's not. He's going to get taken down. He's going to get strangled. Then we have Brady He Stand, or Brady High Stand, however the fuck you say it, taking on Garrett Armfield. So we've got Spokane's wrestler jiu-jitsu nerd taking on Garrett the bartender Armfield. Uh, I like Garrett Armfield in this matchup, and I like him just about everywhere. Brady He Stand is an all-action wrestler, all heart, but I don't think he's that good at striking, and I don't think his cardio is god-tier enough to just drown Garrett Armfield. I can see Brady Hastin getting one, maybe two takedowns, not being able to get the control time that he needs, getting a little tired. Garrett Armfield starts shucking him off and then just popping away at him to win a unanimous decision or a round three stoppage. 
Garrett Armfield's one of my more confident picks. If you do want to see more about that, I did do an individual breakdown on this fight that is over on my channel, so go check that out. Then on the prelims, we've got Josh Quinlan taking on Adam Fugit. And guys, this is going to be my first underdog pick here. I'm taking Adam Fugit. Uh, I actually thought that the line was going to shift in favor of Adam Fugit, and to my surprise, it went from a pick him to, uh, he's almost at a plus 100 now, Adam Fugit to a minus, uh, minus 120 for uh, Josh Quinlan there. Josh Quinlan fights very short. You know, he, he's got those short little T-Rex hook arms, and uh, he tries to take people's heads off, but hasn't been working for him. He's getting outstruck by the taller, longer, more elusive strikers in the form of Trey Waters and my boy, Danny Barlow. I bet on both of those gentlemen to uh, defeat Josh Quinlan, so been cashing on both of Josh Quinlan's last fights, and I think I'm going to cash again here because... I think people are just assuming, oh, hey, Josh Quinlan's got power. Adam Fugit's been knocked down in most of his fights. That means he's going to get finished. No. Danny Barlow beat the fucking piss out of Josh Quinlan, and I don't know how Josh Quinlan's going to recover from that. It was different than the Trey Waters fight. Danny Barlow was beating Josh Quinlan bad. Like, that was, that was a bad beat-up that he took there, and you always question how people are going to come out after that. I don't know if he's going to come out gun-shy. I don't know if he's going to come out technical. You don't know what Josh Quinlan's going to come out like. I know what version of Adam Fugit I'm going to get here. My only concern on the Adam Fugit side is he is starting to get a little bit long in the tooth, and he is aging a bit. If this was two years ago, I think that Adam Fugit would comfortably be sitting at around a minus 150 favorite here. But I understand some people's hesitancy here. But I don't understand is why so many people are on the Josh Quinlan side here. But hey, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm not seeing something. But if you believe in me and my picks, we're beating Adam Fugit this weekend. Now, on to my slam of the week. We got Tegea Ulanbekov, my Dagestani brother, taking on Joshua Van. Joshua Van, a very exciting prospect. And I think that if this was a few years from now, I would probably be on the Joshua Van side. But he's almost a three-to-one dog here. Tegea Ulanbekov, you know, fights out of that phenomenal camp. He's got that Dagestani wrestling style. Uh, his striking is serviceable. He is quite long for the division with that 70 inch reach, uh, and he stands at five foot. It says five foot seven, but I swear he's almost like five foot eight. He's going to be quite a bit taller than Joshua Van here. Joshua Van is going to have to work his way onto the inside, or he's going to have to stuff all the takedowns all night. I think to get Ulanbekov is just a bit more physical, a bit bigger. I think he's going to get Joshua Van down in each and every round, and he's going to win a unanimous decision 30 27 or by submission. I'm betting on to get Erlen back off. <laughs> then we got Jimmy Flick taking on Nate Maness. Jimmy Flick is a 4-1 to underdog here, and I almost want to bet on him because his submission game is slick, but that is where it ends for him. Every time he's striking on the feet, it looks like somebody's going to knock him out cold, and Nate Maness, I think, is the guy that's going to do it. I think he's going to put the, the, the hammer to the nail, put Jimmy Flick away here. I think Nate Maness is huge, 5'10", you know, I think if you're betting this, bet Nate Maness and just sprinkle Jimmy Flick round one submission. Just just in case he does some weird shit and locks up a heel hook, gets another flying triangle, you know, because Jimmy Flick is an opportunistic and dangerous submission threat. But on the feet, I think Nate Maness is going to put him away. So one of the safest bets, I would think, is just bet this fight not to go the distance. But for the algorithm, for the pick, we're going Nate Maness here. I wouldn't play him straight at these odds, so I wouldn't play his money line. It's... It's too wide. Nate Menes isn't a four to one. He isn't a four to one fighter. Then we have Carly Judas, who is taking on Gabriella Fernandez. And I'm going to be honest with you guys. Uh, I watched a little bit of tape on both these ladies, and my ultimate conclusion was: don't bet on this fight. Uh, I don't really see great promise in either of these ladies. Some people do. Some people were talking up Carly Judas is striking. I didn't like what I saw out of either of these ladies, and truthfully. I won't be paying much attention on it, so I'm, I'm not going to give too much of an opinion on this. We're moving on. I think Gabriela Fernandez probably edges it out, but I'm not going to say something when I don't see it. You know what I mean? Then we have Jekka Sergei. Little story time here. Uh, Jekka Sergei, he fought, I believe it was Lucas Alexander, I want to say. Um, 
and I had a buddy of mine. I just moved here, just moved into my new house. We were watching the UFC. He came up to see me. We watched the UFC together. We like to throw a little bits on here. We saw the man was from Indonesia. Uh, me and him had both just been on holiday to Indonesia together. And we thought, fuck it, let's just bet on him by KO. He was the dog, and we both made a few hundred dollars on him here. And I was pumped, and I was excited to see him uh, matched up inside the UFC again. Unfortunately, it's here against Weston Wilson, and he's a three to three and a half to one favorite over Weston Wilson. I would rather pick Jekka Sergei in fights where people are expecting him to lose. Because Jekka Sergei is such a dangerous and explosive fighter, but he has some holes in his game, I don't like playing him at this three and a half favorite option here. I think that Jekka Sergei is dangerous. He's explosive, you know. He's definitely got round one KOs for days. Uh, he's got an explosive knockout over one Binky, which uh, has aged incredibly well here. You know, he's got that knockout now in the UFC, but he did lose to Unshul Jobli. <sighs> Unsure Jubilee is not a good loss to have on your resume there. Um, Weston Wilson, though, kind of sucks. He kind of looks like, uh, I don't know, he just looks like he's not very good, to be honest with you. I don't want to roast him. I feel like every everybody I've heard has just roasted the hell out of Weston Wilson. Uh, I don't think you should bet on Jekka Sierra's money line. If you are going to play him, play him inside the distance. Uh, maybe sprinkle round one and round two. Weston Wilson, though, he's not UFC caliber. As for Jekka, time will tell. But it, like I say, I would pick Jekka Sergey in spots where he's a two or three to one dog himself because he is dangerous. Uh, but in this instance, I'm not playing him. Then we got Milky Mix, uh, Milky Melquizel Costa taking on Shailen Nerdenbeke. Uh, I think from when I've listened to the interviews of Costa, I think he's a fighter's fighter, man. I think this guy is in this for life. I think he loves the game. I think it's a place where he feels special in this world, and he's going to give it everything he has. And honestly, simply for that reason alone, I'll be picking him. But I do think he's the better striker in this matchup too. I think Nurun Becky is a heavy hitter, but not heavy enough to actually put out people with one punch. He's a heavy hitter though, and um, I think it's not going to be enough here. People were talking about the wrestling of Nerd and Becky like he's going to dominate Costa. That's not going to happen. This fight is either Shailen Nerd and Becky gets lucky, chins Costa, or Costa wins a unanimous decision here. That's that's truthfully how I see it going. And I see it going in the form of the decision. Ms. Qu oh, this name is doing my head in. Mel Quizel Costa, <laughs> Milky Costa, I'm going to call him, uh, is going to defeat Shailen Nerd and Becky. And I'd put that at a quite high level of confidence. Then last but not least, we have uh, Josephine Knudsen taking on Julia Palastri. And Josephine Knudsen, I don't know why it says Julia Palastri's record to one on one. That is not correct. Uh, Josephine Knudsen here, 10 and 0, perfect record, fighting out of Sweden. I love everything about her except for the fact that she doesn't have great finishing instincts. I would lay all the money in the world on her on this matchup if I knew that she was just a little bit more of a finishing, finishing style of fighter. Her fight against Manic Man, she could have finished her so easily. Just keep throwing hands. Manic Man showed up. Just keep throwing hands. Even just pitter patter against, and then, you know, da, 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 big heavy hook. Da, da, da. But instead, she didn't. She kept going in on the grappling. So, some questionable decision making there. Other than that, though, Josephine Knutson should be the cleaner, more technical fighter here. I think that she's going to win this fight in the grappling and the striking. And I think that at a two to one favorite here, she's a parlay piece, she's a lock. And I will be betting on Josephine Knutson. Guys, if you did make it this far in the video, I did just want to shout out to Charles. He did win a $50 giveaway where I said to pick an underdog in the comment section. Uh, he was the only one who picked the correct underdog. That was a few weeks ago, but finally got him paid. So congratulations to you, Charles. Uh, other than that, Thank you very much to everybody for uh, helping me reach 350 subscribers. I truly do appreciate it. And uh, if you're one of the OGs, drop a comment in below. And uh, other than that, man, thank you guys for everything. I look forward each and every week to breaking down these fights with you guys. And I will see you all in the weekend where we hopefully all make some money, make some bank, and uh, looking forward to just more weeks of fights rolling in. Other than that, guys, I'm out. I'll see you in the next one.